maybe I'm using that word synonymously with feeling anxious and nervous and overwhelmed. But in reality, stress encompasses a whole lot more than that. Stress reappraisal is a very particular type of changing the way we think about the situation. This is about acknowledging that yes, there is a performance demand upon you, you're speaking, you've got an exam, acknowledging that, but also harnessing your inner abilities to, to deal with that. You're in a stressful situation. When you notice changes in your body, when you notice your heart starting to beat a little bit harder or faster, or your palms getting sweaty, just remember this podcast episode. Remember that this is your body helping you. Hello everybody and welcome back to the Mental Wellbeing College. Today we are joined by Dr. Emily Hangen to discuss all things stress reappraisal. Emily is a visiting assistant professor at Fairfield University, is an instructor at the Harvard Extension School and is about to commence as an assistant professor at the State University of New York, Crockpot. In today's episode, We discuss why the message that stress kills can actually be damaging for us, the psychology and neuroscience behind embracing stress, how seeing stress as a challenge can actually help you perform better in exams, and much, much more. If today's episode of the Mental Wellbeing College brings value to your life, we would be so grateful if you were to hit subscribe, follow, or to share this podcast with someone you care about. Our mission is to provide free, accessible resource based on evidence that people can use to improve the mental well-being of their lives the world over and you sharing subscribing and or following helps us to grow and hit that mission thanks so much for tuning in today and now to today's discussion with dr emily hangen on all things stress reappraisal before we dive into today's episode of the Mental Wellbeing College, an important disclaimer. We do dive into the weeds of mental health, which means that at times we discuss sensitive topics like suicide, self-harm and substance abuse. If hearing such discussion does bring up distress for you, please do seek the psychological and professional treatment that you need. The content covered in this episode is not intended as a substitute for professional mental health treatment. All right, Dr. Emily Hangen, welcome to the Mental Wellbeing College. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. It's fantastic to, to have you on. I'm always excited to talk about uh, practical topics and tools, which your research is really based around, and this conversation is going to be really steeped around. But before we get to the practical frameworks and tools surrounding stress reappraisal, it'd be good to have a bit of a chat around uh, stress itself more broadly. So I'm, I'm curious, Emily, as a, a researcher in stress reappraisal, what are your thoughts on why stress is always made to be the villain? Yeah, that's definitely an idea I was exposed to myself growing up. And I think a very common, strong collective belief is that stress is our enemy, that it's going to be unhealthy for us, that it's going to hurt our performance, and that the best thing we can do to cope with stress is get rid of it as soon as possible, (laughs) right? That the best thing to do in a stressful situation is try to tamp it down, try to calm down and relax. And the good news, especially for any listeners out there who might struggle a lot with stress, it's hard to be human and get by in life without experiencing stress. The good reassuring news is that we don't have to fight it. That's what we really um, learn from research on stress reappraisal and what I hope to share with you and our listeners today is that we don't need to fight our stress response. In fact, quite the opposite. In fact, stress can be an ally. It's this untapped resource that can really help people perform at our best and, and be healthy which I think is quite the opposite of what a lot of people maybe originally think of when we talk about stress. And I think a big part of that is just simply how we use that word stress, how we throw it out in our everyday language. I think it's pretty misused in that we only cover half the story. When I hear people say I'm stressed, when I hear my students say I'm stressed, or even when I say I'm stressed, I'm usually limiting the use of that word for negative situations, for situations where maybe I'm using that word 
synonymously with feeling anxious and nervous and overwhelmed. But in reality, stress encompasses a whole lot more than that. Um, For instance, one of the questions I like to ask people is, have you ever been skydiving? So I don't know, Indy, have you ever been skydiving? (laughs) Twice, and it was absolutely terrifying. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, then maybe skydiving is not going to be our best example here, but the fact that you voluntarily went yeah. skydiving, um, or I imagine a lot of listeners may be able to relate to going on a roller coaster. Okay. Um, yeah. Typically, we we seek out those experiences. I mean, we will pay mm, to go yeah. skydiving or on these roller coasters, and what might be happening during that experience is we're having a stress reaction. We might be having the same physiological reaction. The same thing is happening in our body in those moments as it is when I'm complaining before a big exam or an interview that I'm stressed, but we're labeling it differently because of the context. But we don't normally say I'm stressed when I'm on a roller coaster. I might say I'm excited. This is exhilarating, right? I feel so alive and and that we can see it as a positive experience. So that's one way I think this word doesn't get used when it could, which is we're having a stress reaction. We're just not labeling it as I'm feeling stressed. Um, Another thing I want to say about this idea that stress is the enemy Mm -hmm. is I think we often think that stress is going to hurt our performance, that if I want to perform well, I want to avoid being stressed. Although I think there are some areas in culture where we actually embrace and encourage stress, but again, we don't call it that. We don't name it as I'm trying to increase my stress levels. Uh, For example, uh, we can think about in sports. We don't necessarily want athletes going out to the field or to big game, you know, drowsy, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, really calm and relaxed. Yes, we, we don't want them panicked. We want them focused. And at the same time, we want them energized. I know from even in my own life, going to things like pep rallies, the purpose of a pep rally is basically to like heighten our energy, to like get ramped up, to get that high activation is what we're encouraging. But we'll use words like getting pumped up or getting hyped up and things like that. We don't say we're trying to get stressed when in fact that is a bit of what we're doing. Um, And so I think that's part of what's fed into this idea that stress is the enemy, that stress is bad for us, because we tend to use the word stress only in situations that are unpleasant, that are negative. Um, and there's plenty more I can like talk about that if we want to like revisit this idea. Uh, but I'm sure we'll dive into this continuing as we talk more about stress reappraisal. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's very true, I suppose, even in my own life, what you're saying about the the negative side of the the stress coin and that really being what we we focus on. I think anytime in my life I hear someone say I'm stressed, the immediate reaction that I and many others around me have is what's wrong and you know, how can we fix that? What can we do to, to change that? And even in, you know, psychology studies, it's um, in terms of studies as in uh, what I was taught at university, Pretty much the whole way through, it's taught. We're taught about stress management. You know, like you said, how can we kind of reduce that, dampen that, uh, rather than harnessing it and, and reappraising it, uh, much like your work kind of shows. So, yeah, it certainly is. And and I hmm. love the word you use there of of harnessing it, right? Because I agree. I I had a similar educational experience that when I was taught about stress, I was taught about the negative consequences that it's going to be bad for my health, right? It's going to lead to cardiovascular disease. It suppresses my immune system. I'm going to be more susceptible to getting sick and and all these negative things. And that's a half truth (laughs) that yes, there are certain types of stress that do lead to those things. So I want to be careful here to not say embrace all kinds of stress because there are certain kinds of stress that are unhealthy. The problem is, is that's usually the only kind we talk about. Um, And we don't have as much focus and talk about how stress can actually be beneficial, that there are certain types that don't come with any health costs and can actually boost people's performance. Mm, yeah. And so given that there's kind of two sides to that coin and that there are those positive effects of stress, I'm curious, how, how is it kind of received by people that you speak to, whether it's uh, students that you might teach 
or when you're just talking about your your research what's the immediate reaction because when I first came across this it it, it does seem quite revolutionary given again just how much of the other quote-unquote negative side of stress that that coin is talks about and how little uh, this side of the coin is talked about. I think that's why stress reappraisal as a strategy works. It works because we're countering these misconceptions out there. And I actually think it's like when I when I share this, it's, it can actually be pretty well received. I don't get too much resistance when I get into the details and explain. Basically, we've talked about stress using it as a blanket term and really oversimplifying it. But when I explain the different kinds of stress and how that actually operates in our body and what the research shows about how that helps our performance, um, I find that most people tend to be pretty receptive to that. It's just something we haven't heard, or at least for me, before doing this work and getting involved in the stress research, it wasn't something I had been exposed to. And that's the wonderful thing about stress reappraisal. It's simply being exposed to this, being educated about this, it's really all it takes before we can start harnessing stress in a beneficial way. Yeah, it certainly seems very uh, accessible, stress reappraisal, and, and very not, not very resource intensive to be able to, to change your mindset around stress. And we'll certainly dive into some of the interventions that you and others have, have looked at and how we can uh, reappraise stress in a more functional way. But I'm curious, in terms of the misconceptions about stress, what do you think the role of media or pop culture is in uh, portraying these kind of misconceptions? And are there other influences you think that have contributed to this? Or, you know, overall, why do we feel this way about stress? It's a good question. Um, I think the, the reason it's hard to answer is because this idea that stress is bad is so pervasive <laughs> that I think it yeah. gets reinforced even in our like conversations from person to person. Um, I think something that's fed into this is how we're taught about stress and that how there was a big push, I think, early on to label stress as this is dangerous and <laughs> that stress is unhealthy for you. I think there was a big movement um, that came out several, several decades ago, a long time ago, really propelling this idea that, look, we're discovering that stress is really bad for your health, that it's it's not helpful. You could get ulcers. This is a really bad thing. And I think that idea has been maintained. Um, and I think it feeds into an intuitive experience, which is will now recognize when we're having an unpleasant stress reaction. And that is the narrative we've been fed, which is stress is bad for me. It's going to make me perform worse. It's unhealthy for me. And then we pile on top of that this, oh, I shouldn't be stressed. And it it's kind of becomes this negative feedback loop. And I think we reinforce that with each other when we talk to each other and people say, I'm stressed. Even the advice we give reinforces the idea that stress is bad. In fact, one of my favorite studies about this was done by um, Alyssa Brooks, and she had asked people, she asked people, what do you think is the best advice to give someone going into a stressful situation? Over 90% of the people in her study, she had about 300 adults in this study, over 90% of them all said the same thing. Um, Indy, do you want to take any guesses as to what they said was the best thing to do before a stressful situation? Uh, definitely calming it down, inhibiting, you know, doing some deep breathing, something to reduce the amount of stress you're feeling, I imagine. Exactly. Exactly. You got it exactly right. It's this common advice of calm down, right? Like take a few deep breaths, but like try to calm down. And in fact, when I, when I share this research with people, I'll ask them that same question. I'll ask them like, Raise of hands, how many of you have given that advice or heard the advice that the best thing to do is to try to calm down? And it's it's pervasive. A lot of people give that advice. Here's the problem, though. What does that advice assume or imply about how stress affects our performance? If we're saying the best thing to do is to try to calm down and tamp down stress, what's the implication? It's that stress is going to hurt our performance. That's the underlying assumption that we are 
sharing with each other when we give that advice. But we can do research. We can actually look into that question and see, does stress actually lead to worse performance? And it's not quite as clear as saying, yeah, stress is bad for your performance. There's an important distinction that tends to get looked over and neglected. And the good news is that calming down can be a really hard thing. I don't know about you, Indy, but for me in situations when people, if I'm really stressed, having someone tell me to calm down isn't an easy thing to do. I can't just immediately implement it. I mean, there are plenty of people I think who are much better at this skill than I am, but when we are in a really stressful situation, it's usually for good reason. It's something we really care about. It's something we're invested in and with the outcome and just trying to immediately calm down can be really difficult once our body is in this high energy, high activation state. The good news is we don't have to calm down in order to perform well, which is what stress reappraisal really gets into. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head there. Something I observe a lot uh, in clients who go out of sessions trying to implement things like mindfulness or some sort of breathing strategy to uh, dampen the stress response, if you like, and to help regulate themselves is it often leads to more heightened stress response in the sense that they become distressed about the fact that they can't regulate their stress and the skill that they're trying to implement isn't working for them. So, uh, yeah, it can almost become like a tug of war trying to reduce, you know, your stress, which, uh, is counterproductive and in, in actuality leads to an increase in, in stress response, at least from what I observe. Yeah, it absolutely can worsen it if we feel like that's our only solution, that we have to get rid of our stress response in order to do well, because then, then I think people can feel really trapped and feel a lot of pressure of like, I need to decrease the stress when in fact, there are, there are multiple options. And um, getting rid of stress doesn't have to be the only strategy that we use. So I, I think there's a lot of benefits to mindfulness strategies, and there are definitely particular types of stress where that would be the best thing to use. But there's a large swath of stress reactions we have that it's actually better not to get rid of our stress. So that's good news for listeners who have a hard time, right, reducing their stress reactions. In terms of the uh, cultural influences or why we have these stress misconceptions, I was doing a quick um, Google search, Google News, just put in stress, see what comes up. And overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly it was you know negative things like, you know, stress is killing me and uh, seven daily habits to reduce stress. And absolute, this one headline, absolute mayhem, Eurostar passenger tells of stress and tears. And it, it certainly seems pervasive in media and in pop culture that, that stress is bad and do everything you can to avoid it. Yeah. And that really, again, oversimplifies because when we use the term stress, we could actually be referring to very different things. Mm. And, and that's what gets glossed over in these news headlines or when we talk about stress and trying to reduce it, we aren't acknowledging and we maybe aren't collectively aware but there are actually different kinds of stress reactions our bodies are having and that some of those actually can really fuel us and can be healthy and boost our performance. Yeah. Well, you mentioned something there, Emily, about stress reactions. Is it useful for people to understand the distinction between a stress response and a stress reaction and a stressor or an event that might trigger a stress response? Is there any utility in that from what you've seen? It's a good question. I think one thing is it gets muddy when people talk about stress and stressors. I think one of the helpful distinctions in maybe separating out the words we're using here is that when we talk about a stressor, that's something that maybe might elicit a stress reaction from us. But a stressor in and of itself doesn't necessarily automatically do something to us. There is a space between encountering some sort of challenging situation or um, thought, whatever it might be, some sort of stimulus, whether it's within ourselves, our thoughts that we're having or outside of ourselves. And there is a space there for us to make sense 
of that. Um, and what I mean by that is we get to think about things and reframe things. And that is what's going to affect our body's reaction. And so there's this key space between a stressor and our stress reaction. And that's a really critical key space because that becomes the area that we gain control and we get to really kind of be empowered in that space. Um, to give you kind of an example of this, maybe thinking about emotional reactions and the importance of that that what we might call an appraisal piece. How am I thinking about the situation? Um, that really is the power to affect how our bodies react. So for instance, if I look down on the floor and I see a shoelace, but I think that it's a snake. If I think I see a snake, well, I might get startled. My heart rate might spike up. My body is going to react as though there is a snake there, regardless of whether or not there is. It's what I think about the situation that matters. And I think the same here, and maybe there's a value or benefit in separating out the difference between my body stress reaction and something, a stressor, something that might elicit a stress reaction, because it's that thinking space. That's the appraisal of the situation that really is critical and really matters because that's going to affect how my body responds. Mm, and it feels very empowering to know that because your response is something that you have control over, even when sometimes you may not have control over your external situation or your external environment. So the, the stress or the event itself, sometimes you can't change it if you need to give a speech in front of a, you know, a few people for a class, for example, but then the reaction you have, the way you appraise things, the way you look at things is something more within your control that you can access and change for benefits in your own life. Absolutely. Absolutely. This is really a key piece. And I think a piece that sometimes gets overlooked is we have the power and how we think about the situation mm. is going to have a big impact. And that's important because oftentimes we don't get to choose the situations mm. or make things less stressful. Oh, I don't want to take that big exam. Well, mm. you know, that may not be in your control. And in mm. fact, one of the studies we, we've um, looked at actually had to do with students taking a big exam and their reactions were different, not because the exam was different, but because the way they were thinking about something changed and that in turn affected their body's response and their performance. So it is very empowering because it means we don't need to avoid challenging or stressful situations because that's not really feasible. That's not really possible. It's hard to get by in life just trying to avoid anything that might be stressful. Um, but also it tells us we don't need to change that, that we can meet the situation and be empowered to do that um, by using particular strategies research has shown us are effective. Yeah, let's talk through some of those strategies. Uh, what is stress reappraisal and, and how do you go about getting people to reappraise their stress in some of the work that you've done? Yes. So in talking about stress reappraisal, I need to make a really important distinction between two different kinds of stress or maybe multiple kinds of stress. I'll start with this is when the stress I'm about to talk about challenge and threat stress states, these two different types of stress states. They're both what we'd call acute stress, meaning they tend to be really intense, but short lived. Um, in contrast to what we describe as chronic stress, stress that's really long term, right? Stress that might carry on. I might be having a stress reaction over the course of months or years. Uh, things that might lead to this might be things like living in poverty, family crises or marital discord, um, living through a global pandemic for many months and years, right? Like these can elicit things like chronic stress. And when it comes to chronic stress, the research is pretty clear that chronic stress is unhealthy for us. It really can wreak havoc on our bodies. It really can wear and tear um, our bodies. And, and there's not many benefits to chronic, that long-term stress. But then we have situations that can elicit acute stress responses. This can be something like before a big game or before taking a big exam or before doing a job interview. All these things, our stress tends to be can be really intense, like I can feel my heart racing in those moments. And on the other hand, it doesn't last super long because it's tied to that event. And once that event ends, right, my stress might 
dampen and come down and my stress reaction it ends. So challenge and threat stress states are both kinds of acute stress states. Now I'm going to talk about them as though they're like two separate things when in fact they're more of like ends of continuum. Like there's kind of a spectrum. I could be mildly threatened. I could be in a really strong threat stress state and same for challenge stress states. But here's the thing. They are different. Our body is having a slightly different reaction between a challenge and threat stress state. They're both stress states, right? Both of these, you might see a heart rate increase. So if you're just going through your day to day and you have a stress reaction, you feel your heart increase, your heart beating fast, you're not going to necessarily know whether you're in a challenge or threat stress state. Um, they share that similarity. But here's the difference. The difference, um, actually, let me go, let me explain the difference this way, which is to talk about how they develop. So stress reactions are reactions, right? A stress is a response to something. So when we're in a stressful situation where we we have to engage. If I just ignore the stressful situation, I'm not going to feel stressed, right? If I have a big stressful exam and I decide I'm not going to take it, right? Well, then my body's not going to have that stress reaction. But if I do engage in the situation, this is where that space that I talked about matters. Here's my stressor, this big exam. Now, before my body reacts, the key thing here is what do I think about the situation? And what we do is we do this almost automatic, almost unconscious, rapid sort of assessment of how difficult is the situation and what resources do I have to handle the situation? For instance, um, let's say I need to get up and sing in front of a crowd of people, right? So there are certain demands I might notice there. One, I'm going to be judged by other people, right? That makes it difficult. Um, I have to actually physically do something. I need to sing, right? That's going to require something of me, right? There's all these things we might think about of what makes the situation difficult or uncertain or things that might make me a little nervous or stressed about this. And at the same time, we're doing this quick rapid fire assessment of what resources do I have that's going to help me in this situation? And when I say resources, I mean it very broadly here, not like money and things like that. I'm thinking about things like what sort of skills do I have? Um, did I practice the song before I came to you know, sing in front of these people? Do I have practice performing in front of people? Right. These are all resources I can pull upon to help me meet the demands of the situation. So what we're doing is even without really thinking about it, we're automatically assessing or appraising both the demands and our resources to meet those demands. And this is critical because this is going to determine whether we end up in a challenge stress state or a threat stress state. And it comes down to which wins out. Do I think that I can meet the demands of the situation that my resources meet or exceed these demands? Yes. It's a challenging situation, but I, I have the resources to meet it. Yes, there are demands here, but I, I think I can accomplish this. When we think that we can, our body reacts accordingly. It gives us added energy to help us meet the demands of the situation. So if we want to get technical, what happens in a challenge stress state is we see activation of the SAM axis, which is an acronym. It stands for sympathetic adrenal medullary axis. But basically, this is what gets our heart rate going up. This is what's increasing our physiological arousal. It's a high energy state. And as our heart is starting to beat faster, our blood vessels stay nice and open and dilated. And what this does is it allows for more rapid blood flow throughout our entire body. And that's great because that blood is carrying oxygen to our muscles to allow us to move when we need to. It's also carrying oxygen to our brain, which is great if I need to be alert and thinking quickly. And what research shows is people tend to perform their best in challenge stress states, even better than if they were relaxed. So if you want to perform at your best, you want to be in a challenge state. Now, 
when it comes to the appraisal process, right, demands versus resources, we could go the other way. I could say, oh, I have to sing in front of people and I'm tone deaf and I have stage fright and I do not think I have the resources to cope with this situation. And as a result, when I think I can't cope because my resources don't meet the demands or at least my appraisal of my resources, I think I don't have the resources to meet what I think are the demands of the situation, then my body thinks I'm in danger. And my body is going to do what it can to help me in a dangerous situation. So what happens is even though that same SAM act access gets activated. So part of our sympathetic nervous system, if people have heard of the fight or flight response, we're talking about activation of our sympathetic nervous system. And that's the activation of our SAM access. So our heart rate increases, but here's a key difference between a threat state versus a challenge state. In a threat stress state, we also get activation of our HPA access, known as the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal access. This is where we also get things like the release of cortisol. So if you've ever heard, if people have heard of research where people are measuring cortisol levels, that really relates to threat stress states with the activation of this APA access. And our bodies act a little bit differently here. Even though our heart rate is going up, our heart is pumping faster, our blood vessels that lead out to our muscles and to our brain actually constrict. And so effectively what this does is even though our heart is working really hard, blood is not flowing through the body as rapidly or as efficiently. If anything, more blood is staying kind of pooled in the core of our body, right where our heart is. And it's not really getting out to our muscles or to our brain as well. This is beneficial. If you think about it, if I'm in a dangerous situation, right? If I, you know, there's a potential my arm's gonna be bitten off by an animal, like I don't want a lot of blood flowing there really fast, right? This is nature's natural tourniquet. It's defensive, it's protective of us. Yeah. Here's the problem though, yeah. is that if we aren't getting that blood flow to our muscles and to our brain, that's gonna affect our physical and mental performance. And that's exactly what the research shows that people will tend to perform worse in a threat state than even if they were relaxed. So if we think about, you know, our best performance, threat states are terrible. We don't want to be in a threat state. Um, being relaxed would be better than a threat state. So when people give you the advice to calm down and relax, well, if you're in a threat state, that's great. But if you want to perform at your best, you don't actually want to be in a relaxed state. We want to move over to a challenge stress state. So hopefully at this point, I've convinced us that like <laughs> challenge stress states, that's where we want to be. It leads to better performance. It's healthy. We don't see any of those negative health outcomes associated with stress. Those aren't associated with challenge states. So how do we get there? It comes down to that appraisal process. How am I appraising the demands of this situation? What do I think of those? And what do I think my resources are? Stress-free appraisal is a very particular type of changing the way we think about the situation. Uh, we call this cognitive reappraisal, reframing the way we think about this. There's plenty of examples, I think, people using this without realizing that they're using cognitive reappraisal. For instance, maybe I'm giving a speech and I don't wanna be nervous, so I you know, imagine everyone's my grandma, or I don't look at anyone, like I'm yeah. you know, trying to imagine they're not even there, right? Or I'm going in to take an exam and I remind myself, look, it's not life or death, like I'm gonna be fine, right? We're changing the way we think about the situation, but typically those strategies, we're changing the way we think to try to lower our stress. That's not what stress for your appraisal is about. It's not about trying to relax more, right? I'm not trying to think, oh, this isn't life or death, so I relax. Stress for your appraisal is a particular kind of cognitive for your appraisal, a particular way we're gonna change the way we think about the situation. What we're gonna change the way we think about is our body's stress reaction. Hmm. When we're having a strong, acute stress reaction, we can typically sense it. I can feel my heart pounding, my palms getting sweaty, right? Those signs that we feel when we're having a stress reaction. And most people think stress is bad for them, right? When they start to feel those signs, they think, oh no, I'm stressed, I need to calm down, this is a bad thing. Stress reappraisal is so simple. All it is, is knowing that your body's stress response can actually be helpful to you, not hurtful. Just knowing that 
can be enough that when people are having a stress reaction, instead of going, oh no, panic, this is not good, I need to calm down, they go, great, <laughs> great, I need my body to be helping me right now. This is my body's way of energizing me to help me perform even better. And that can be enough to sort of tip the scales between our appraised demands and resources because now we think of our stress response, our body's reaction, as an added resource. And that can be enough to get people into a challenge state. So that's that's really in a sum what stress reappraisal is. Everyone who listens to this has now had a stress reappraisal intervention because all it is is teaching people your body's stress response is helpful. That's all it is. And once people know that, then it's easier to get into those challenge stress states when they start to notice those physiological signs of being stressed. Hello everyone, a quick break from today's episode. At the Mental Wellbeing College, we are committed to the goal of communicating evidence-based wellbeing strategies out to the broader community. The goal of this podcast is to bridge a gap between self-help material and peer-reviewed research by providing evidence-based discussion that respects the nuances of psychology, but is digestible for all audiences. Ultimately, I hope that you as a listener feel empowered after each episode so that you can take away and implement strategies to improve your own mental well-being. If you have gained value from this episode of the Mental Wellbeing College, I would be so grateful if you were to hit subscribe or follow or to share this episode with someone that you love. This is how we continue to grow the show get the message out and to impact people in need by providing such information and strategies. Thanks so much for tuning in. It means a lot to us here at the Mental Wellbeing College. And now back to today's episode. There's a, there's a lot there. So in terms of the, the neurobiology, right, and the kind of the, the physical changes that we see uh, as a result of a, a challenge state versus the, the threat state, it seems like uh, as well we get a different kind of hormonal profile uh, having a look at some of the studies that you guys have, have done you and i think jeremy jameson um things like dhea and testosterone even a, a higher and more elevated when you get the or when you're in more of the the challenge rather than the threat state so again kind of making the case for you know these regenerative rebuilding hormones coming in more of the, the challenge state, so much more healthier uh, profile to be in. And it seems like coming to your second point about everyone's just had a uh, stress reappraisal intervention is that in the studies that you guys uh, have carried out, that's all it is, isn't it? Is, is people literally reading or listening to the benefits of stress, whether it's through those anabolic hormones, whether it's through the increased cardiac output like you were going through, that in itself changes people's physiology and the way that they approach a stressful event. Is that, am I exaggerating the claims there or is that is that what you see? That is absolutely correct. No, no exaggeration at all. Really, challenge and threat stress states do have very different physiological profiles. We can see this with different sort of hormones, as you've listed, um, but even just different things uh, like cardiovascular wise, right? I can see that we have greater blood flow in a challenge state and potentially even less blood flow in a threat state as compared to being relaxed. So we can we can measure these things. There are ways where we bring people in for experiments into the lab where we can put on all these different cardiovascular sensors and we can identify whether someone is having a challenge or a threat stress reaction because these are sort of opposite sort of states. Even though they're both stress states, in challenge states, we see an increase in cardiac output, greater blood flow, and blood vessels stay nice, open, and dilated. Whereas we see the complete opposite in a threat stress state, where we can see sometimes even a decrease in cardiac output, and we see an increase in blood pressure, right, in these uh, blood vessels constricting. Um, and then, as you said, right? Different hormonal changes as well that we can identify. There are ways to differentiate because these are two very different stress states that are occurring. And then, yeah, the intervention is so easy. It doesn't require any sort of invasive drugs or long, you know, hours of training and therapy. It's simple. In fact, I'll share one of our studies, which is one 
we did with students. We did with uh, community college students in a remedial math course. And by remedial, what I mean is this was for students who had struggled in math previously, and this course was required. They needed to pass this class to continue on in their college degree. So high stakes. And we anticipated a lot of these people would probably feel pretty anxious about taking these math exams. Um, and that's, you know, when we looked at it, we measured everyone at the start and we found, yeah, there are relatively high levels of math anxiety and things like that. And what we did is we randomized, we had some people in our experimental group where all they got was a little pamphlet, really, a couple of things that they read that taught them that stress can actually be beneficial. They answered a few questions just to show us that they were reading the materials, whereas our control group or what we'd even call a placebo group, uh, a placebo because they might think they're getting the intervention because we gave them the common wisdom, the intuitive idea that, hey, try not to think about what's stressing you, right? Try to calm down. That's going to be the best thing to do before this exam, what most people think is good advice. And what we found is in just this quick five to eight minutes of reading materials. That's all it was. Um, when we looked at how they performed on this upcoming exam, because we looked at how they performed at a first exam, we did that for everyone, then we introduced the intervention. And what we found is that students who learned that stress was good for them, that it could be beneficial compared to the students who, were, who weren't taught that, these students who got the stress reappraisal intervention their math anxiety was lowered. They reported perceiving more coping resources going into the exam, and they earned higher exam scores, statistically significantly higher exam scores than the individuals who didn't get this. And, and one thing I love to note about the study is we asked them about their resources, what they perceived, and also we asked them about perceived demands of like, how challenging do you think this math exam is going to be? And here's the thing. The groups didn't differ in how challenging they thought the math exam would be. How difficult do you think this exam is going to be? Both groups, you know, thought were kind of equal in how difficult they thought the math exam. It wasn't about making us, right, trying to delude ourselves and think, oh, everything's going to be easy, right? That's not what stress reappraisal does. Instead, it empowers us to realize we have the resources. And one of those resources is our body. Our body's stress response is an added resource. Um, but yeah, it's it really is um, exciting to me that something so simple as a few reading materials can make such a big measurable difference because all it is, is about changing people's minds. It's not so much what the reading materials are, things like that. It's about changing the way people think about stress. Yeah, I love that. And it really comes back to what we were saying earlier about harnessing right, your, your inner resources and your harnessing the stress response to, to help you deal with your environment rather than magical thinking or, like you said, deluding yourself. Because I think that can be, I don't know if it's your experience in teaching it to others, but that was the initial doubt and, and cynicism that I had was, okay, is this just positive thinking? Am I just trying to, you know, uh, wishful thinking about, you know, the the process and trying to dampen what is a real st really stressful situation and trying to pretend that it's not but that's certainly not the case this is about acknowledging that yes there is a performance demand upon you you're speaking you've got an exam acknowledging that but also harnessing your inner abilities to to deal with that i think that's the liberating aspect of it is it means i can acknowledge that these things are difficult, that I'm going into a difficult situation. I can acknowledge that my body is responding to that. And instead of trying to ignore the difficulty of the situation or dismiss the difficulty of the situation, and instead of trying to like um, really control my body and try to get it to stop having this response, I can identify and realize that my body's response is actually helpful because in reality, it is. Our stress responses are meant to be adaptive, whether it's meant to help us really engage in the situation or even as a protective mechanism. Our body's responding in these ways, not just arbitrarily, but because it's adaptive, it's meant to help us. And just simply changing the way we think about it can have 
shifts in exactly how our body is responding and reacting in ways that can really impact our performance. Um, and the nice thing is we don't have to get rid of it, right? I don't have to pretend I'm not stressed. I don't have to get rid of it that way. I don't even have to be excited. Um, I think that's a misconception too, that if I'm in a challenge state, it means I'm excited. It doesn't mean I'm excited. It could be, but it could also mean, hey, like I am I am nervous and I think think I can meet the situation. I'm nervous and I know my body's reaction is going to help me. And that's what it takes. It doesn't mean I have to be happy about what's happening or that I have to feel like this is a great experience. It can be a great experience, but sometimes it's not. You don't need to feel that way to be in a challenge state to use stress reappraisal and to get all these benefits from it. Yeah. And in terms of the benefits that you know, you outlined. So you, you talked about that exam there and how it can really help immediately. One of the things that I love in some of these experiments that you and other stress reappraisal researchers have done is it seems like there's a bit of a domino effect as well and that often is the case that months later in subsequent exams, the people who were given the intervention just one off before the initial exam, months later also perform better because it seems to have a knock-on effect, a domino effect on their study behaviors and the way that they approach maths and studying, less likely to avoid it because of that math anxiety, like you alluded to, more likely to do the work uh, and therefore see better results months down the line, even after just doing a five-minute intervention you know, way earlier um, in the piece. Yes, because the intervention is about changing the way we think about the world, the way we think about our stress reactions. And, and that is one of the really exciting things about this intervention is that one time can be enough to have cumulative effects throughout the rest of our lives. And it, and it doesn't have to be limited either. You can transfer this to any situation where you have stress. It doesn't have to be limited to, well, I learned this for an exam. You can apply it to, you know, a big job interview or before a game, you know, all sorts of things, whatever you have stress. So it's transferable. It has compounding and cumulative effects because if we change the way we think about the situation, we can take and carry that with us to any stressful situation, any time where our bodies might have that stress reaction. And in addition to benefiting ourselves that way, we've also conducted research suggesting that teaching stress reappraisal to one person, giving them the intervention, can actually have positive effects on someone else. So we, we did this interesting experimental study where we brought people in as partners, as teams, and we gave stress reappraisal intervention to just one of them before they had to do this stressful pitch, product pitch that they were required to do. And what we found is, as we expected, people who got the stress reappraisal intervention ended up in more challenge-like states than people who were in a control group or other groups we had. But the really exciting thing is that their teammate, their partner, who didn't hear anything about the stress reappraisal if their partner had gotten the stress reappraisal intervention, they also showed more challenge-like stress responses. So the really exciting thing is not only does using stress reappraisal potentially have, well, not potentially, has been shown to benefit the people who get it, but we have research suggesting it can benefit people around you as well. So it can really not only have compounding effects for one person, but it can spread to others yeah that was super fascinating to see it's almost contagious and again some of the outcomes you saw was literally that as i understand it the teammate teammates physiology was also changed so just by not only can thinking about your resources and the way that you or the the way that you deal with stress change your own physiology but it can impact the physiology of someone, like you said, that you're working with a teammate, which uh, is kind of blows my mind. Just again, short five minute intervention, changing yourself physically, but also the physiology of someone around you. We see it changes physiology and we see that it affects performance. And 
there's a lot of questions we have as why, how is it being contagious that way, mm-hmm. right? It's not like it's some sort of germ that's been <laughs> spread out there, yeah. right? Like, so it's interesting for us to, to really, um, we have continued questions about how is this working? How is it that one person being in a challenge state helps get their teammate or partner to also be in a challenge state? So we still have questions there, but what we do know descriptively is that giving stress for your appraisal to one person did have positive effects for not just them, but also their partner. Um, So yeah, really, really exciting um, benefits that we're seeing here with stress reappraisal interventions. Yeah, yeah, really exciting. And you alluded to this earlier, Emily, in terms of when stress reappraisal may not be appropriate. Talked about uh, chronic stress, and it seems to be performance situations, acute situations, uh, public speaking exams where stress reappraisal is most beneficial and where most of the research is. What are some of the other limitations or are there other situations where stress reappraisal isn't as uh, appropriate or at least the research hasn't shown it's uh, as appropriate yet? Yes. And I think this is a really important distinction to make because just as much as I want to really highlight the nuance of stress to say, hey, look, there's a other side to stress that is actually helpful. I don't want to ignore that there is a side to stress that can be really unhealthy and that we don't want to embrace that kind of stress. For instance, I had mentioned before, yes, chronic stress a stress reaction that has gone on for a particularly long time over the course of months and things like that, um, we don't want to necessarily embrace that. And so there are limitations. Stress reappraisal has so many applications, but that tends to be restricted to situations where we need to perform Right, we're engaging. And when I say perform, what I mean is that it requires something of us. Um, it's an active activity that we're doing. It's not me passively just sitting back and listening to someone. Um, I wouldn't necessarily get a challenge response to that because it doesn't require anything of me. So it's challenge stress states tend to be elicited in situations where we have to engage actively in a situation and that they are short-term acute stress responses. Um, And because of that, those are the only instances where stress reappraisal interventions work because stress reappraisal are all about getting us into a challenge state. So when we think about chronic long-term stress, stress reappraisal would not be an appropriate intervention to use there um, because we're not necessarily going to get you into at a challenge state. Um, so there are instances where where this, this strategy is not going to be effective. But if you are in a situation where you need to engage, you need to do something, whether that be physical or mental, we see stress reappraisal helps people get higher scores on GRE exams, like, you know, graduate um, standardized math exams, right? Things like that. It's not just physical, but we also see it in the physical realm. There's plenty of great sports psychology research showing getting people into a challenge state helps them perform better physically. So if it's an activity that is required, right? Stress reappraisal can be so beneficial there. But in other instances, when we're talking about long-term chronic stress, Stress reappraisal isn't necessarily, and it doesn't make sense that it would help because it's not going to shift you into a challenge short-term stress state if you're experiencing something really long-term. So there are instances where stress reappraisal doesn't apply and we have to be careful because again, when we say stress, that encompasses a lot of different things and stress reappraisal may not be appropriate for each of those different sort of circumstances. Yeah, yeah, no, very, very well said to acknowledge um, those limitations. But I suppose coming back to the benefits as well, just wanted to share, you know, since coming through or looking through your research, it's really changed my own relationship with acute stress, particularly in uh, social situations. Like, to be honest, coming on, you know, and doing podcasts um, often. I feel my stress physiology increase and heart rate coming up, for example, but previously the strategy was more of the 
okay, let's engage in some mindfulness strategies. Let's focus on my breath. And I reference this being with clients, the, the tug of war, the wrestle, but I have experienced that as well. Whereas now I find it a much smoother process to be able to reappraise my own stress response, to use that, to harness it. And it's just a lot easier to not have to engage in that tug of war. So I'm excited for uh, listeners and students to be able to hopefully have that same experience, whatever stressors are going on in, in their life in an acute sense. And I suppose on that, in terms of people using it and implementing it in their own life, are there particular kind of final tips that you could provide to help that implementation process, to help make it a smooth ride from people uh, listening to this to actually actually implementing it in their in their own life? It's a great question. I mean, fortunately, stress reappraisal, one of the benefits is it is easy to implement. Um, unlike the advice to calm down, which can sometimes be a bit of a struggle, like you were saying, kind of that tug and war of wanting to you know, perform well, but also trying to like keep ourselves calm. Um, I think one of the benefits of stress reappraisal is that it is easy to implement, right? All you have to do is change the way you think about stress. That's it. You don't have to try to change something going on in your body. That will happen as a consequence of changing the way we think about stress. And I'm, I'm so happy and pleased to hear that it's been something useful to you in your life. I know it's been useful to me in mine. I, I use it all the time, stress reappraisal. And, and this is what the research shows us as well, that for, for many people, right, this is a really helpful strategy and it is one that can be easy to use. All you have to do is next time you're in a stressful situation, when you notice changes in your body, when you notice your heart starting to beat a little bit harder or faster, or your palms getting sweaty, just remember this podcast episode. Remember that this is your body helping you. And that's all you have to do. If you can remember and embrace that, it becomes kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy in that your body does help you. It does help you get into this challenge state, which improves your performance, improves your health, um, and can be very empowering. Thanks so much for tuning in to today's episode of the Mental Wellbeing College. If you've made it this far, it means you've gleaned a ton of value from today's episode or you've fallen asleep. I sincerely hope that it's the former. And if it is, I would be so grateful if you were to hit subscribe, follow, or to share this podcast with someone you care about. Our mission here at the Mentor Wellbeing College is to provide a free and accessible resource for people to take action and implement to improve their own mental wellbeing. And you subscribing, following, and or sharing helps us to achieve that mission and to impact people in Need. Thanks so much for tuning in. It means a lot. We'll see you next week on the Mentor Wellbeing College.